Let's take our Bibles now, and we will turn to the book of Luke, chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 21. It's a long passage, so I'm going to kind of stop and explain some things along the way as we look at more confirmation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that Mary last week was told that she was going to have a child. But how the Lord didn't just leave her hanging, but that he reaffirmed it time and time again. We saw that John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, kicked whenever he saw the Lord or whenever he became in the Lord's presence. And then, of course, the first person filled with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was Elizabeth, and she sang out the glories of God. And then we see after the, uh, the birth of our Lord Jesus, of course, the Lord had to reaffirm that to Joseph also. So here we have all these things that had to go around with Mary and to just to reaffirm that, hey, listen, this wasn't some vision that you saw, but it was a real angel out of heaven that in the name of the child and so forth. Um, and then we saw the shepherd, or we know of the shepherds. We didn't, we didn't read that story, but uh, <clears throat> the shepherds came and said, "That's him." And now we see two more people that, uh, during the Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us in Galatians four four that uh, uh, in the fullness of time, sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. It's interesting now as we look at this passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, how many times that we see the law was fulfilled, how that Mary and Elizabeth did the same thing as far as the law was concerned. He was made under the law, or he was born under the law. And yet, of course, he came to break us free from the law of sin. The law law was our uh, schoolmaster of what sin is all about, and to give us life eternal. But notice now in chapter 21, this was after the shepherds, notice they returned in verse 20. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. <clears throat> so notice uh, the angel, the heaven, we see uh, four people in the Bible that are named from heaven. And that is Ishmael and Isaac and John the Baptist and Jesus. And so we see that these four were not named by man, but were named by the God of heaven. But notice his name was Jesus, which was so named by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So it was God's plan all along. And when the days of our purification, now notice first of all, eight days. <clears throat> the Jewish calendar, or when a child was born, Eight days later, incidentally, the doctors have found that that is the exact time when a a child has the most immunities as well as the blood coagulates the best is eight days after they're born, that he was to be circumcised. You remember back in um, in, uh, in Luke chapter 1, you had uh, the great, there was a great ceremony for John, remember him? And uh, they had a great uh, circumcision ceremony. And they said, go name him after their dad. And remember what happened? Zacharias uh, was mute because of the angel saying this is a sign. And as soon as he wrote out the name John, guess what? He was able to speak. And that was all part of this great ceremony that they would have when children, were, or especially sons, were born. And he became a, an official citizen of Israel through circumcision. This was his identity. And this goes all the way back to the time of Abraham when God said this was a sign of of the Jewish race. And so we see this was their identity. And notice it says now, here's another ceremony that comes along. And when the days of her purification to the law of Moses were accomplished, uh, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer sacrifice according to all that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and young pigeons. So we know by the law of Moses, starts back in Exodus chapter 13, when that child, that firstborn child was to be dedicated to the Lord, that he would be presented to, to the Lord. And this would be 
uh, about 33 days after the, uh, after the circumcision. So here are about 40 days, 40 to 41 days, uh, after the Lord was born, we see that now he is presented in the temple. This is much like Hannah did as she went and presented uh, her child to the Lord. In fact, she gave the, her child to the Lord back in for Samuel. So we see that uh, this was, she was doing exactly as the law said she was to do. And, uh, and so she brings this, the child to the temple and dedicates him to the Lord um, and to offer sacrifice. Now, this tells us several things. Notice that she offered turtle doves. That's the poor man's offering. And we notice 41 days or about 41 days after the birth of the Jesus. That tells us that she was still poor, which tells us that the wise men hadn't gotten there yet. Because if she had gold, frankincense, and myrrh, she would have been able to buy a lamb, would she not? And so we know also that uh, we don't know exactly when they came, but uh, we know that Herod wanted to play it safe and all children, hot, two years old and younger. And we also know that, uh, that the Bible tells us in Matthew that uh, when the wise men came, that um, Joseph had rented a house at least, or was in a house. So we know that this wasn't all. But, you know, well, well Pastor, you know, we have, I was a wise man in the Christmas story. Let's don't worry about it. Let's don't get that technical. I'm just telling you this is the way it is, and if you want to include it in, uh, we're not going to call you a heretic or whatever, you know. But uh, it's just a beautiful way, the way that God brought this together, and the timing of it isn't uh, typical of what we think. And he probably wasn't in a stick manger with hay in it. He was probably in an old cave up there in those Judean hills, and that's where they, uh, where they would take the... the uh, the um, animals at night, and from what I understand, it could be pretty stinking. And one of the things that uh, would, and one of the great uh, miracles of the birth was that Mary didn't die from infection. You know, so it's just all the different things that had to work out. And we romanticize it, and yet God knew we were going to do it. You know, so I'm not, I'm not upset about it. Isn't it great? Uh, just think about it. All the different things in all the different parts, young people, old people, babes in the manger, shepherds, all these things. What a beautiful story of what God has done. But here you have, she, she gives a, a poor man or a poor person's offering of turtle doves. And a turtle dove, if you could find them around and they would sell them, of course, because they're on a temple, she probably paid a t- couple of dollars in order to be able to give those as an offering. She couldn't afford a lamb, don't know how much those would cost, but she gave turtle doves. And now notice it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, in verse 25, whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when he, his parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Notice the law, the law. He was born under the law. Then he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to the Gentiles and a glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and Mary marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for a fall and a rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul. How would you like to have that as a mother? This is going to hurt you very badly. He said, that, uh, thou, the, that thou th- thy thoughts um, of thine heart may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess. And notice all these came in the direction of the Lord in the fullness of time, exactly at the right time. This wasn't planned on their part, but God coordinated, 
coordinated this. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phinuel, of the tribe of Asher. And by the way, the one thing that uh, we know about the tribe of Asher, we don't know much about them, but they had a reputation that all the, 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 the prettiest girls in Israel were from Asher. So that was tradition as well as, and so we see that uh, she was from the tribe of Asher. Uh, she was of great age and had lived a hundred and, uh, excuse me, uh, with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and 84 years. Now we have problems with this because of the syntax. Does that mean that she was 84 years old or did she live with her husband and then was a widow for 84 years? If she was a widow for 84 years, that makes her 106 years old. If she was, born, if she was married at uh, 16 or years old. Uh, which departed uh, from the temple, but served the Lord with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in the instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption of Israel. And when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to, into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now, Father... We pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, nothing escapes your notice, that your timing is perfect, that your systems and the way that you deal with us are beyond our capacity to even find out. The whole idea of infinity, the whole idea of omnipotence, the whole idea, Lord, of eternity is totally out of our grasp. But you tell us, Lord, that you have put the world in our hearts, that we cannot know the end from the beginning. And so that's not within our capacity to know until we see you face to face. But Lord, may we take what you tell us and believe by faith that those who come unto you through the blood of this child-born Son of God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, but came to earth to die on the cross for our sins. Oh, Lord, the message that must get out. People are lost and on their way to, on their way to hell. Darkness is covering our nation because of sin. Oh, Father, how we pray that the light of the gospel will shine forth again through this church and others like it, as we would be the light bearers of the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Oh, bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see here that we have several different movements going on. Mary and Joseph are doing exactly what God told them to do. They were good people. They were righteous people. And righteous people were people who followed the Lord. These were remnant people that we're talking about this morning because we know that the priesthood was corrupt. We know that uh, the, the political parties, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the uh, Herodians, they were all corrupt. We know the Lord had to cleanse the, cleanse the temple twice in his ministry. We see all these things that are going around, and yet you have this remnant of people. And the Bible tells us back in Malachi that they would gather in the temple and in chapter 4, and they, would, and they would talk one to another. And this would be much like what was happening here with, uh, with two people that were temple dwellers. We don't know their background as far as uh, other than where, uh, where she was, what tribe she was from. But uh, we see now that these people, uh, we don't know their income. We don't know how, how, they were, uh, how they were supported. But we do, do know that they would meet at the temple and they were known around as the righteous. Now notice, first of all, we see that the Bible tells us in verse 25 that, uh, that Simeon was a just man. He was known for justice, if you want to say, or an honorable man, an honest man. And uh, he was a righteous man, as we would call now a righteous person, a Jew would call it. And in fact, they still use that term today. There are several heroes of the Holocaust, people that protected Jews. And one of them, uh, they made a movie of about several years ago, Adam Schindler. And uh, he is buried uh, 
and he is called a righteous person. Now, he was a scoundrel in many areas, but he, he, loved, he protected the Jews, and so they call him a righteous man today. And so, and you will see several of the, uh, of the centurions are called righteous people because they got saved. There's not a bad centurion in all the New Testament. It's interesting how that God worked through uh, those, those Roman army officers. But here we see he's a just man, which is the idea that he was a man that was spiritual and he was, uh, that he was a very honest man. Notice, so people, that was his relationship to man. Notice he was devout, which is the idea that he's in relationship with God. And then we see he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the Lord. The Old Testament, they were looking forward to the Lord. Job, the first book of the Old Testament, probably. The Bible says that Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And everything in the Old Testament pointed to that, but it was always incomplete. Abraham looked in Moses. They looked for cities without hands. They, they were looking, uh, not made with hands. They were looking for, for the consolation of Israel. Even Abraham thought that his, you know, if the Lord uh, made him kill his child and he was going to raise, rise again, he didn't know exactly what the Messiah was all about but there was, as it kept being developed in the Old Testament. But we see that it always ended incomplete. The Old Testament ends, I mean, the book of Genesis, after Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the promises, it ends in a coffin in Egypt. Isn't it interesting? The last phrase of the book of Genesis. And we should go and we see the Davidic covenant. We see uh, all the different things that God did with the Jew. And they were looking forward to, the, that, to that child coming. The prophets were, were saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And all these different prophecies. But then we see Malachi, 400 years before this time in Luke chapter 2, says that uh, 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 pronounces a curse. You know, that there's a curse. So here, all, all the Old Testament, the first book of the Bible ends with a uh, coffin in Egypt, and the last book of the uh, Old Testament ends with a curse. You know, so there was just always short. All of sin and come what? Short of the glory of God. And then we open up with the New Testament and we see, we start off with the Old Testament as Matthew, as we saw God blessed and brought as he promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that a child would come through him and David, of course. And then in spite of all the problems that they had had and even some of the evil women or, and some of the fallen women and some of the honorable women, how that God brought forth his son just like he said he was going to do. And then we turn over to the book of Luke and we see uh, how that uh, the world is spinning. You've got a, a dictator over in far off Rome when Rome was at its height and he decided all the world was to be taxed and it played right into God's hands or God designed it that way. And what, why did Mary and, and Joseph go to Bethlehem? Because they were ordered by a man a thousand miles away to go uh, and, but it was all prophesied ahead of time that the child would be born where? In Bethlehem. Isn't it interesting how God in his providence does all this? And now after the child is born, and when the, the, after the pronouncement and Mary is reassured and the angels show up, the Bible says uh, in Luke chapter 2 that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Many people have wondered if uh, Mary kept a uh, little keepsake. Um, any of you ladies keep a lock of hair of your children? Did you write down little things or their footprints? Or uh, It was popular for a while, but remember those little booties that children had? And then they would uh, bronze them or whatever. And none of you ladies did that? Every one of you did. But, you know, <laughs> there were little keepsakes that you kept. For, and so Mary kept these things. You can imagine what that must have been. And I imagine Luke was able to even talk to Mary in some of these areas but because Luke becomes very personal with these people. I mean, he, he, he really shows a heart for uh, the, uh, Mary and for others. But notice now uh, that, um, that uh, Simeon was waiting for the Lord. Now, Peter tells us that in the last days and whenever we, after... Uh, there were already people in his day that said, where's the promise of his coming? 
the Old Testament, the Jew was looking forward to the Messiah coming. Today, folks, we're looking for him to come again. And what is happening today? People are falling by the wayside because they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, the Lord's not coming. And boy, I get, and I don't watch a lot of television, especially network television. I just, I can't, sitcoms as they call them, I can't endure those things. They're just, <laughs> there's just something about them. Uh, and most of them are blasphemous or whatever, or whatever today. So I don't listen. Now, I love Lucy or something like that. I might get enthralled in, especially with the candy factory or what, you know, but some of that. But other than that, I really don't like the, you know, watching them. But whenever I go to get my oil changed or go to a doctor's office or whatever, and there's some show on, it's always one of these modern shows. And, they're either, and the last one I saw was uh, they were, uh, some guy was sitting at the counter talking behind, to people behind the counter, and they were talking about 666. And they were, oh, all this stuff. And they were going into how that you had to be so, uh, um, what, uh, I mean, you had to be off, off your rocker to think of all those things as being superstitious, you had all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, this is playing right into the devil's hands. You know, it's just amazing how that the world is scoffing at what God says is going to happen. And here we know that, I mean, the, the, the Israel had given up. I mean, they were pretty happy with where they were. Obviously, the Pharisees were happy with what they were. The Sadducees weren't looking for him to come again. Uh, Herod certainly wasn't. The world wasn't looking. But here you have this remnant who is saying the Lord is coming again. Or, excuse me, the Lord is coming. And they were looking. And notice he's looking for the Lord, the Messiah to come. And folks, let's keep our eyes on the skies because God's coming again. I like to say... The Lord is going to come to Illinois first, because, especially in January, because it's cloudy the whole month, and he's coming in the clouds. And so no matter how bad it gets as far as in January and it's all snowy, look up because the Lord says he's coming. And you say, well, what about those people in Sierra Desert where there's no, where there's no clouds? The Lord has ways of making clouds, so he'll do what he wants to do. But, uh, you know, there again is don't get down because God's coming again. And this man now, retired, whatever, we don't know exactly how old he was. But we notice he's part of that remnant, part of those people say, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And I'm praying for his coming. Should we not be praying, even so, come Lord Jesus? I, someone has postulated that the Lord Jesus is going to come during Christmas because that's the one time of the year nobody's looking for him. Isn't it? We're all so busy. We've got so many things going on. And uh, folks... I said many times, uh, I don't want to die. I hope that I am part and be known through from now through eternity. You know, I was the baby boomer generation and all that. I want to be the rapture generation in heaven. I'm one of those guys that got to go up eternity in heaven. Don't you want to be part of the rapture generation? I mean, that's the best generation to be part of. But here, the Lord had assured this man. And notice the play. We notice this was such an important event in history. We see the angels and the Holy Spirit very active during these times. And so we see that, uh, notice, um, and it says in verse 26, and it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, um, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, or God's Messiah. He was going to see the Messiah. Now, I don't think the, the, the Lord is going to tell me. He says, no man's going to know when the Lord comes again. So he's not going to tell me. But folks, we can look at the signs around us. And if the Lord doesn't come soon, then we're going to be in a bunch of trouble. I'd lot rather for the Lord to come sooner than later. Especially for my grandkids. <laughs> especially for, uh, I mean, just what's happening in our country. Folks, some of the policies that are that are going on and what they're doing to children today and some of the things is child abuse. Government sponsored. Sad to see a generation of kids that are brought up warped. They just had a something and I'm glad that a hallmark of all people. They had a commercial. I saw it on the internet the other day and it was talking about some and they had two brides kissing. And of course, Hall, they got such a, fortunately, they got such a backlash from everybody that they've taken that off. That just shows you where we are. 
Hallmark, you know? How sad. Even Lord, come before it takes over. Come before it affects, you know, and my kids get, or my great grand, my great grandkids get, I, I want the Lord to come. You know, this whole world's not my home, I'm just a passing through. But I'm sure that old Simeon saw all the things that were going around, and he knew about Herod, and he knew about the corruption of the Pharisees and the priesthood. He knew that temple wasn't what it ought to be. And he knew that, uh, that man was sinful. And he was looking, and God gave him a gift. He said, you're not going to die before you see the Lord, the Messiah. And so, and notice though, again, the Holy Spirit says, that's him. You know, uh, with John the Baptist, he said, Mama, that's him. Elizabeth said, that's him. Uh, 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 Joseph said, that's him. Zacharias said, that's him. And here we see again, after the birth, the shepherd said, this is him. Now we see after he's born, two more people saying, that's him. Godly people. And then, of course, even at the beginning of his uh, ministry, we see the Lord. I'm sure that Mary was there at his baptism. And uh, what happened? The, the God of heaven said, that's him, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. God kept, they kept, the Lord, the God of heaven kept saying, that's him. And here we see that this older man now, he says he came in the spirit into the temple, came at exactly at the right time when Mary and Joseph were there, when the parents brought in the child Jesus, that's a divine encounter, after the custom of the law, then took he him into his arms and blessed God and said, now for a mother of a newborn child to let a strange man take him, it shows that she had respect for this guy, and he was very well known. How many of your mothers would give, uh, would give your child who's uh, 41 days old to a stranger? Not many of you. But here we see he took him into her arms, his arms. He said, Lord, now I'm ready to die. <laughs> you know, what a blessing. What a way to go. But he says, uh, Lord, now uh, may thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And that's exactly what Joshua means, or J J uh, Jesus means. Jesus is the Greek counterpart to Hoshea, which is Jehovah's salvation. And here he is saying, here he is, salvation. Hoshea. And so we see uh, that uh, he said, I have seen salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Here we see, for God so loved the world, not only the Jew, but the Gentiles. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he wasn't only to the Jew, but to the Gentile also. To the glory of the, notice it would be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. They were still God's people. And Joseph and his mother marveled. Can you imagine seeing this man and now they're marveling at this spiritual man who says all these things? What a blessing. There again, Mary was told, Elizabeth said the same thing that the angel said to Mary. And now we have Joseph and Mary being reaffirmed after the child's born, again with basically the same thing that the angel said. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for a falling and rising again of Israel. Some are going to be a stumbling block. It, to, you know, the cross is to them that perish a stumbling block. But the, to them that are saved, it's the power of God. But notice it says, A rising again of Israel for a sign which will be spoken against. So there are going to be people against him. Yea, a sword shall pierce thine own soul also. Can you imagine seeing your son on a cross and seeing a Roman soldier walk up and pierce his side? I think as a mother, you would feel like it pierced your heart. 
And here we see that he was born to die. I mean, this was no, the fullness of time, the program of God, everything about the salvation of man was no mistake. It was planned from the very beginning, before the beginning of the world. And so we see a sword will pierce thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many may be revealed. Then we see again another lady, and Anna, we've already mentioned her about her age. She was a prophetess. We know there are several prophets. Even in the book of Acts, there were lady prophets. We don't know exactly what that means. They were given the gift of prophecy. They didn't have the office, but they did have the gift of prophesying. That all died out. Remember, prophecies have ceased, and they've ceased. When the word of God came. But to notice, uh, she was from the tribe of Asher, Asher and um, she was of great age. She was a widow, which departed not from the temple. So she was one of those that went and prayed and fasted night and day. She was a real prayer warrior. She was known around the temple. She would probably be many to the, of the, and like all religious organizations, there are those who are just as corrupt as the day is long, but they kind of honor those who aren't. You know, uh, they, the holy people, you know, they're off to themselves, but, you know, they in, um, kind of reminds and she wasn't a nun, but, you know, it's kind of like what the Catholics do. They look at, at certain people as more holy than they are. And I imagine that's the way she wasn't a nun, but uh, there again, she was considered a holy woman and, and it didn't really matter that I wasn't, but she, but she was. I think you understand what I'm saying. So people would know, and it didn't change the temple at all. They were still just corrupt as the day was long. But yet there were still godly people that were willing to worship God, just like in the days of Hannah, when it was so corrupt that God cursed Eli. And yet there was a godly woman. And wasn't it sad that when Hannah was praying at the, um, at the altar that uh, that. Eli thought that she was drunk because there weren't that many people around that prayed like Anna did. Isn't that sad when people think that you're, you're strange or that you're drunk because you're trying to seek the Lord? And here we have Anna, or Anna, as she is before the Lord. And notice it says, and she coming in at that instant, there again, when the whole, Simeon had the child in her, his arms, and she gave thanks unto the Lord and spake to all of them that looked at the redemption of Israel. There again, that's him. Isn't it great? When God tells you to do something, folks, God will reassure you along the way. I like what uh, Hudson Taylor, that great missionary to China, said, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. And so it is in life. That's, he, he went off to China when there were no radios and televisions. And he proved that to be true in his life, how that God, time after time, took care of him. But here we see that, uh, that this lady praying and seeking the Lord, and, she, and now Mary with this great burden that she's going to carry. And yes, what a, horrible, what a horrible thought that she had in her mind that, yes, my child is going to cause sorrow. After all, he was a man of sorrows, wasn't he? And here we see that the consolation was that this older lady now comes in, and with this young lady, she says, that's him. And it reminds her again of God's promises to her. Blessed art thou among women. So we see God's tender care of this dear, dear girl, this young lady who God selected to bring forth the child, of, the child God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice it says, and when they had performed all these things, according to the law, again, we go back to the fact of what Paul said, that Jesus, that Jesus Christ was born, made of a woman, what? Made under the law. To redeem them that were under the curse of the law. Folks, his whole idea of coming was to break us free from that law, the power of the law, the lesson of the law is that we're all sinners. And just like the Holy Spirit worked in, in the lives of Simeon and Anna, the Bible tells us today 
that, we, uh, that this, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ today, it's because the same Holy Spirit that was working in Simeon and Anna called you to salvation. He, it wasn't that you were seeking him. He was seeking you. And do you remember the time when you realized that you were a sinner and that you needed salvation and you came to God and said, oh Lord, forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and save me. I hope everybody here can say, yes, I know that, that uh, I know when I did that or I know what I did. I can't remember exactly when, but I know exa- that I did it. That is all part of the calling and the working of the Holy Spirit. The exact time I mean, somebody had to tell somebody, had to tell somebody, and all the people had to be in place to tell you that Jesus saves. And you look back and say, boy, I had enough sense to accept the Lord. No, it's because the Lord Jesus worked. I don't understand it all totally myself. I could have rejected him, and yet I accepted him. I don't know why. But, and folks, those are all part of the things that you don't get into. Just wait until the Lord will explain it one day. But just the miracle of the new birth. Because the same Holy Spirit that was working back in the temple 2,000 years ago in the 1900s, most of us were saved in the 20th century, we were saved from the same Holy Spirit that came and dealt with us. Do you know him? Were you called according to his purpose? Has the Lord Jesus Christ come into your heart and saved you? Well, I don't accept all that. Well, my friend... It's not, the important thing is not that you reject God. The most important thing is when he rejects you. But aren't you glad he still extends the call to whosoever will may come? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he made the way through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. And yes, he even presented to the world through this wonderful woman, Mary. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever leaveth in him should not perish but have eternal life. There again, don't understand why he did it, how he did it. And I don't even understand eternal life. I don't understand eternity. But I'm glad I got it. I don't, if you think about eternity, I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be out there playing a harp all the time. I don't even like harp music. But God's going to keep it interesting for the rest of my life. Folks, it's not that I will have eternal life. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not that you will have eternal life. You have it because you've been born again. And you'll never die. This whole body might pass away. But that's why I want to be part of the, the, one, the people that bodies are instantly transformed. I'd like to be that rapture generation. Boy, wouldn't that be great? But if I'm not, you know, what a way to go. You know, because... We have eternal life through the Holy Spirit who called us in the shed blood of Jesus Christ who redeemed us that we can have eternal life with him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these reassuring aspects to Mary and to Joseph and to Elizabeth and to, and to Zacharias. Lord, how that to, you call them into a mighty work and yet you kept reassuring them all along the way. And just like, Lord, you promised us, you would never, ever, ever leave us or forsake us. So, Lord, in these last days, we pray that we will continue looking for the signs of your coming. We pray that you'll keep us from sin. And, Lord, that that reassuring work of the Holy Spirit, as we would encourage one another, and so much the more as that day approaches, may, may some godly people, here be reassurance to some young people who come our way godly mothers and grandmothers who assure young mothers and young ladies that they can walk with God grandfathers and grandmothers and 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 anyone who is an adult who can reassure a child that Jesus loves them oh Lord we pray your blessings upon us May we be those encouraging factors as Simeon and Anna were to Joseph and Mary. May others 
Call us blessed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.